Yes, fourth industrial revolution. I believe this is the man who came up with this term from the book uh, of the same uh, title which, which he wrote. So this is about the new technologies uh, that that is very, that causes great disruption and causes changes in the way we do things. Like the technologies such as the, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, um, uh, nanotechnology, uh, 3D printing. So all this has changed uh, the way in which we we relate to each other, the way we work, and the way we live. And in some of you who took a great car here, that that this is this is a disruptive technology, right? Uh, Helling app is a disruptive technology that affects the life of taxi drivers, right? So we ask ourselves, how has the fourth industrial revolution affected education? And yes, it, it is said that uh, this 4IR uh, has re re revolutionized higher education, education worldwide. And in Malaysia, we, uh, the Ministry of Education has come up with the, our education blueprint for 10 years uh, to take in account the changes in our education system required because of this uh, uh, coming fourth uh, industrial re revolution. But what about medical education? And yes, so you can see the word here, 4.0. Even medical education, uh, people have been thinking about how medical education is impacted uh, by the changes in higher education for 4.0. Now, some of you here from UKM, you may, may or may not know that uh, uh, Tanshwin Sharifa, your former vice chancellor and medical educator, uh, was the leader of the team who designed our phase one, or rather our year one curriculum 1995 when we first started our school based on the PBL curriculum. So, uh, Tashi Sharifah was the, was the leader uh, of the team. And then, after she left, when she handed over the curriculum to us, over time, we actually added more lectures to the curriculum, as you can see from this depiction here. Over time, from this block of we survey from 95 to 2000, you can see that the uh, uh, self-directed learning time in the timetable is going down, and then the lecture time uh, is increasing, right? And my own survey here, over over a certain number of years, our lectures in phase in the first two years actually increased by about 40%. Okay, so so um. We ask ourselves, why can't we do PBL? Why do we have to start to uh, bring back, bring back le lectures? And these are some of the reasons that's been, that I heard over the past uh, few years because I, I was the PBL coordinator for a number of years. I don't know how many years. It could be 12 years. I don't know. So I started when I was a very young lecturer. I'm still young, but not that young. <laughs> yes. First thing I heard them say to me is that, William, well, we cannot do PBL because our students are too immature because in the US, Canada, their students who go to medical school are graduates already. Ours are from high school. And I was surprised when I went to a PBA conference in Singapore that one of the speakers was a primary school teacher implementing problems based learning. So the primary school kids are more immature than our medical students. In other words, PBL is not a matter of age. PBL is an approach to learning in approximate how human beings learn, whether you are two years old or 20 or 80 years old. It is not a ma matter of our students are too immature. It's just simply an approach to learning. Right, and then they said to me that, you see, when you teach by PBL, the result is poorer. That's why we have to go back and teach by lectures. But what do they mean by result is poorer? They use MCQ testing of minute little facts. That's what you do in lecture press curriculum. After that lecture, you have you have exposed to 100 different little facts. You memorize, you seek for MCQ, and then you pass it, and then you forget. That is the nature of the nature best practice. If you test PBL students with a detailed MCQ, they will do poorly because PBL is about integration and deep learning and understanding. It is not about memorizing small little things in order to forget it later. So you are using the wrong way to measure the effectiveness of PBL. Right, so this is my, my clinician lecturer just two weeks ago told me that one, one of his colleagues, I believe, said to him that during my time, I memorized the whole textbook. Well, that's what, um, that during his time, memorized the whole textbook, that that's how you learn it and pass exam. And, but he was saying that, well, because in your time, there was no internet or smartphone. That's why you memorize your textbook. So he's saying that, why are you trying students to memorize small little facts when their smartphone can do it better? So times have changed whereby we, medical education is no longer focused on small little minor things. We are looking at bigger principles, we are looking at concepts. And that is why understanding is very critical. And you do not measure PBL effectiveness by your little MCQ detail question. In fact, this is a much better way of if 
evaluating the effectiveness of PBL. This is a meta analysis of many, many schools. Some are PBL curriculum, some are lecture curriculum. And they evaluate the, the, the competency of the doctors who came out from this type of curriculum. And they compare the PBL versus the non PBL. And they find that the PBL best ex students were actually better, in, especially in social and cognitive dimension. Now, this is the, the way to evaluate the effectiveness of PBL is how good you are in producing your outcome, which is a medical doctor, not how well you do your MCQ. So therefore, we were looking at the wrong, wrong output, okay? So PBL has proven effects already in terms of its ability to produce the outcome that we want. And then they said to me that you can only, students can only learn by lectures. You want to do PBL? Go ahead. But we still have to have lectures because learning occurs by lectures. Right, so that's the, that's why you won't have a good foundation. You must you must have PBL. And I was I was surprised when I think about myself and my and when I was in school. Like when I want to think about what the lecturer is talking about, at the moment I start to think about what he's talking about, I lost the lecture. I cannot follow him anymore. I cannot say to him, Prof, can you stop for one minute? I want to think. I cannot. If I were to think, I lost him. If I were to follow him, I don't think. So what should I do? I follow him. I copy notes. I copy notes. So lecture is a process whereby the notes of the lecturer transfer to the notes of the student without passing through the mind of either one. Right. So this is a, a photocopy machine. This is not a thinking, an approach that, that, that engendered thinking. Right. So how do they pass the exam after hearing what or after hearing 50 lectures? Very easy. All you gotta do is go home and go over your lecture notes and read for yourself. Because everything in lecture is gone after five minutes. So in order to survive the exam, you go back and learn by yourself and talk to your friends, right? And when you have a lot of lectures, some students cannot do this. They are not able to keep up with the amount of material by themselves and therefore they fail their exam in the lecture-based curriculum. And, and the reason why they fail is because there's no learning or little learning occurring in the classroom. All the learning occurs later on because nobody can learn by transferring of knowledge from one person to another without cable or even with Bluetooth, it doesn't work like that. Knowledge is constructed in the mind of the student. It cannot be transmitted from somebody else. And that is why uh, lecture does not really equate to learning. And in fact, some of the latest research is very, very telling. This one uh, uh, is, is, is a comment from Carl Weidman, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, uh, saying that large-scale comparison uh, shows a clear message in teaching, whereby the, the people using lecture-based curriculum versus active learning approach. When you look at their way, look at the results of the exams, you find that the failure rate of lecture-based people is much higher or high, significantly higher than the failure rate of people who do active learning approach. So the conclusion is that, that uh, uh, STEM courses especially, using traditional lecture is an inferior education, right? This was published in PNAS in, uh, by, by a comment from the Nobel Prize winner. Another important one, I think, uh, is this paper, uh, which, which compares inquiry-based learning is again another active learning approach. And it looks this time at the kind of students you take in, because sometimes in Malaysia, we, we wonder where the students are coming from. What is your background? What is the background of students? Are they strong background? Are they weaker background? And so this study looks at the background of students who come into the course and divide them into four strata. The ones who are, are stronger and the ones who are weaker. And then, Look at comparing the lecture-based learning versus inquiry-based learning and look at your marks. And we can see that over, over time, uh, this is the, 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 the higher background students, this is the weaker background uh, students. And everybody have, uh, does well, everybody achieves marks, that's pretty good. But in terms of improvement of grades, in terms of improvement of grades from when they first came in, those that came from the, uh, this inquiry-based learning, those, that, those who are from the weaker background, the weaker student, they actually have a much higher improvement compared to the, to the strong student. In other words, inquiry-based learning, active learning, actually favors the weak students. The weak students cannot survive in the lecture-based course because they have to go back and do their own work. Whereas in the active learning approach, they are hands-on. They are learning as they do and work in the classroom, and this helps them a lot, and therefore, when they are weak students, they, are, they benefit much more. And that's very critical for us, because we often say to ourselves, well, our students are failing, you know? And worse, we say to ourselves, because they are failing, 
we have to give them even more lectures, and that is how you kill them. All right? Because learning does not occur in the class in, in the classroom when you have a lecture-based teaching. And then they also tell me, no, they said, William, I asked the students, what do you want? They said, I want lectures. They told me that I want lectures. And so I also want to ask them, what do you want? And they find I find that great majority prefer PBL. Only about 20% prefer lectures. Right? If I do the same with team based learning, it's about the same. Every call is, is about the same. They once they experience the active-based collaborative learning, they will prefer that much, much more than lectures. In the past, they may not have a choice because they are not exposed to different pedagogy. But once they have a choice, they will not choose lectures. Right? So this is what my students comment. They say lecture is boring and lead to falling asleep. Right? <laughs> falling asleep. I don't know how many of you are sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so they say I want to sit there for one hour and study the slide and study the slide. Very, very nice. And sleepy and, and learn nothing. Right? This is how they feel when they sit in the lecture hall of the, of the lectures in which we say they want uh, my lectures. Yeah, they're falling asleep. Okay? So they don't want a lecture approach. That's what there's a clear message from that. Alright? And then I, I re recently I, I realized, I, I'm sure some of you realize that when you wake up in the morning, you find that you have some thoughts in the morning before you get out of bed. You have some thoughts. I find that if I'm struggling and thinking through some problem, I don't know what to say. When I wake up in the morning, I suddenly know what to say. That means that when I was sleeping, the brain was still processing, is that true? Was still thinking. In other words, the brain never sleeps. True enough. The brain never sleeps. The brain is still processing. Alright. So I ask, I, I, I ask all of us, when does the brain sleep? When does the brain ever sleep? Now this is a good study over here where they, they put electrodes on the student for 24 hours a day for one week. It's the longest. For one week, the students had electrodes on his body, which is measuring the so-called electrodermal activity, which can pick up the changes in the sympathetic nervous system. So you are able to monitor their arousal, their cognition and their emotion. Right? So we do that for one week of the student and find out what, what, what is his, uh, his uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, activity. It's like just, just, just a wristband like, like that, I believe. All right? So very interestingly, after one week, it's day one to day seven, right? Okay, so you know he's a student, right? He goes to he goes to, to uh, he, he study. He goes to the library and study. Right, red color is study. So when he study in the library, what is it, you can see there's a high high level of, of processing of, of information, high level of sympathetic nervous activation, right? And then uh, the, the when he goes to the lab, the lab is green, okay, the yellow. So in the lab also also there is there's a, a thinking going on in the lab, right? And then uh, when he goes to I forget this one. No, 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 this one. Okay, never mind. I forget about the green one. Okay. Uh, but now I want to, to show you sleeping. Yeah, okay, okay, fine, sleeping. You see, it's surprising that sleeping is also the activity, right? Yeah, I'm not surprised because I say that when I'm sleeping, I know I'm thinking, right? Maybe I'm dreaming, I don't know. But there's some activity going on. But, ladies and gentlemen, what happens when you go to lecture? Yellow color. In class, in lecture. There's almost no activity. You want to ask me where the student sleeping? Where is my brain sleeping? It's sleeping in the lecture. That's where the brain is sleeping. There is not much activity going on in the lecture. No one can transfer information. After five minutes, I'm sleeping already. Please wake up, okay? You know, I have auntie who cook rice using a charcoal fire. This is one. No? I'm trying, I'm trying to say that we find it very hard to give up lecturing despite all this evidence, okay? All right. So my auntie cooks rice on the charcoal fire and you have to wait for it to boil and then you, you stop the fire when the rice is ready. And I don't know how many of you eaten the rice cooked on the charcoal fire. I don't need to raise your hand because I don't need to know. I don't know how old you are. I don't need to know that. Right. Yeah. But after some time, there's a technology called rice cooker. And we know about it. And my auntie knows about it. Some people are using rice cooker to cook rice. Should we change to rice cooker? Well, look what's the advantage. You don't have to light the fire. You don't have to wait for the time to off the fire. It's all automatic. Right? So why not do it? My auntie actually thought about it and she concluded that no, she preferred to cook using this fire. I think the reason is because my auntie, she, she doesn't read and write. So she find it very threatening to use something new like that. Right? So she preferred the way she's been doing for the past Many, many years, she rather not change. So what, does she tell me, William, I don't want to change because I don't know how to use No, 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 no. She said the reason why we should cook with, with, with the fire is because the rice tastes better. <laughs> <laughs> Agree? <laughs> one, 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 right? Yeah, the rice 
has better. I think if you force her, if you force people to change when they don't want to change, you may be able to force her to use a rice cooker, but she will still come back to the idea that fire will improve the taste of the rice. If you force her to use a rice cooker, she will do this. She will light the fire <laughs> and her rice cooker. Alright? So, that's a problem. We give them PBL because we said that students benefit from independent learning, active learning, collaborative learning, but we, act, but we actually feel that lecture is the way to learn. So if you give them PPL, they say, fine, I add all the lectures, I mix the two together. So at the moment, you tell the students, you are independent learner, you construct knowledge, you have to do it on your own. Next moment, you say, we give you lecture, because you cannot learn on your own, we have to give it to you. So the students are confused, one moment they can do, one moment they cannot do. Right? So when you mix the two apples together, you end up with lecture and a confused student. It's a waste of time and effort. Right? You, you students end up confused and just forget about PBL. Because the questions come from lectures, why bother about PBL? Right? It will end up with confused students. Just as the rice also end up confused because it's been hit from two different directions, right? So it's very hard to change. Sometimes when we do something for many, many years, it is natural that we prefer the way we do it and we will do anything we can to put back the way in which we were used to it. But our uh, Malaysian uh, 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 higher education has taken note of 4IR and said that we need to have a curriculum that's future ready and this is four different uh, kind of changes to teaching. And I want to focus on the, this one called transformative learning and teaching delivery. Right? Transformative learning and teaching delivery. In other words, we want to deliver to the students not one method or two methods. We want method that's transformative. It's not one method is better, but rather is it transformative? Does it really help and transform the student? Right? So that, that is the, the, the criteria. And then we, we look uh, at, at the, the, the summary here. So as I said to you, uh, uh, the pedagogy is, is as such. And then look this one. The learning is without lectures because lectures is not transformative. So the our own Ministry of Education has indicated that in the 4IR, in the Malaysian Higher Education 4.0, learning primarily is not by lectures anymore. Instead, 21st century pedagogy uh, is a mixture of pedagogy where you are learning on your own. You are a self-determined learner. You are constructing knowledge on your own because only the learner can construct knowledge. No one can put the message into your mind. You have to construct it yourself. Second. Uh, Paragogy means that we learn from our peers, we collaborate with fellow students. Nobody work by themselves nowadays. We work in a team and get the best of everybody. We need to learn how to work as a team. And thirdly, uh, psychology is, is the fact that we have a lot of new technologies. We do, we do blended learning. We will mix uh, uh, all sorts of virtual and other kind of learning together with our classroom face-to-face -face learning. So this is a feature of 21st century pedagogy according to our Ministry of Education. And you can see that the lectures does not really appear here because this is the nature of 21st century pedagogy which is uh, transformative. So here it says clearly that when we do transformative L&T delivery, it is possible by different approaches including problem-based learning right here. It part, it's part, PBL is part of a transformative a learning teaching delivery, but not lectures, right? Learning without lectures. Clearly stated that, right? That times uh, have changed, but right? even our own Ministry of Education uh, is directing us that we should use transformative learning and teaching delivery. And so, we ask ourselves, in, 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 uh, 50 years ago, why would McMaster want to teach their medical students using a new way called problem-based learning, which after the introduction, today has become in the history of education a very important <coughs> moment of the 20th century. Because PBL has been described as the single most innovative change in medical education of the past 40 years now, become 50 years, right? Why does it have so much impact? If lecture-based learning is so good, why do you need to come up with something new? The reason is because lecture-based learning has got lots of problems. That is why they wanted to come up with something else. And so, the, 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 um, yes, the objective for PBL, three of them, as listed here by Aros. The first one is that whatever we teach the students, it must be retrievable. In other words, after all the exams and all the courses, in the first and second year, when they go to the hospital in the third year, they must be able to retrieve whatever they have understood and passed. They, you, they cannot pass it. We don't want a system whereby you do a lot of work, you pass a lot of exams, but when you go to the hospital, you cannot remember anything because all the knowledge is memorized, 
cramped and lost. There is no real understanding. There is no deep learning. It's just a matter of passing exams and focusing on exams. And that, that is how, how PBL uh, uh, was designed, so that the, the, the learning is the learning that has connections and understanding, so that it's retrievable at a future time. It's part of the learner. It is not a memorized and cramming. Second, is that you don't just teach the content, you also teach a way of reasoning. Every time you go through a, a, a sequence of reasoning to help you to approach uh, the clinical scenario. Right? And third one is that there's a lot of new problems that's coming up. Problems in which we, have, we cannot even imagine. We cannot prepare our students for it because we don't even know what it looks like. So we need to teach them how to cope with problems. We need to show them problems and, and so that they know that if I see a problem that I've never seen before, this is how I approach the problem. So that's, that's very critical uh, in order to prepare our, our, our graduates for a world that's changing extremely fast. So, so 50 years ago, this is why the impact of PBL is so great. It moves out of medicine into many other uh, areas, and that's why some of my colleagues here are not from medicine, right? We have people from engineering, right? from is it uh, social, is it? And uh, people from oh, my mind escapes me. See, I didn't memorize it. Okay, never mind. So we have people from other places. Yeah, because nowadays knowledge increases so fast, it increases almost exponentially towards the time they were in now. So that anything you teach in first year, by the time they graduate, uh, some of it may no longer be true. So it's, they cannot depend on you anymore. They have to learn how to learn. Learning how to learn is probably the most critical learning skill they have to, to, to get in the years they come under your teaching. Not so much the content, because the content is changing and it may be obsolete, but they need to learn how to learn by themselves. And that is why uh, it's very important uh, that, that learning nowadays is, is involves self-independent learning. So if you still want to give lectures, your job is in danger because robots can do it much better than you. If you only want to give lectures, that's all you want to do. Because the robot can, can, have, can memorize every textbook out there in all languages. And the robot can also retain every YouTube video out there in, in your topic. The robot has a complete memory retention, 100%. Able to teach in a way that's much better than you. So, uh, lecturing, le lecturing as an as a, as a approach is out. It's on the way out. If it's not on the way out, then uh, in your school, and then, then uh, it is on the way up because robots, robots are coming over. So that's why uh, our high, uh, our our Malaysia education higher education program says that in the past we were in the Malaysia higher education 1.0, and then two and three. But now we're in 4.0. This is where we are now, right? If you're still lecturing, this is where you are. You are still stuck in 1.0. When people are already moving to 4.0, but you're no longer. A, 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 a transmitter of knowledge. No, the students are the ones who are going to, to, to curate their own contents, right? They are, going to, they are the ones who are going to connect information, use the web as a curriculum. You are simply a resource guide. You have changed to a resource guide. No longer a person who is primarily responsible to convey factual inf information. And so that's where we are now. We are, the educator is a resource guide. So times have really changed. For, for us, right? Uh, the, the taxi driver are, are not happy that they're, they're losing their money, their jobs, right? But what about us? We are being affected very, very strongly as well uh, by, by the 4IR. And so, therefore, uh, we are now in the 21st century and the skills our students need are very different from the past. Now, if you continue with lecture, you will not be able to inculcate all these critical skills needed for the 21st century, like the critical thinking, like communication, like collaboration. All this cannot be be uh, nurtured by just giving lectures. That, that, that is why PDL and the approaches of PDL is called transformative. It transforms the students, not just pass a message. It transforms the students into the kind of people needed to survive in the 21st century. When you retire, they are going to be out there facing problems that you've never seen before. Are you preparing them? Or are you just preparing yourselves for retirement? So therefore, our teaching and learning has to change with the times to prepare our next generation to face the world in which they are facing, in which we have no idea. Because we do not come from this world. We are we come, we do not come from this 1.0 world. <laughs> right. So we don't want to be a higher education 1.0 person operating in a higher education 4.0 world. We have to be 4.0 ourselves. We cannot be a person who is trying to, 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 to be one. If you have 1.0, you know what happened? You look at the timetable of a PBL curriculum, you find it's a bit empty. Yes, it's a bit empty. Yes, and we are not happy because we said that if timetable is empty, students are not learning. 
Learning can only occur in the classroom. We must put classes, classes, classes. If it's empty, there's no learning. Because we cannot accept the fact that learning occurs when students construct knowledge in their mind. They don't have to be in the classroom. In fact, it's better that they're not in the classroom. Because they need to construct them in their own mind and with their friends, right? They cannot, they not, cannot rely on a teacher in the classroom. That's why if the timetable is empty, it's totally fine. It's not, the learning is nothing to do with the timetable. Learning has to do with the approach in the education. Your approach and your philosophy and your guiding strategy. It's nothing to do with the timetable being empty. We're not here to fill a timetable. We are here to promote learning. And sometimes we will say, they are okay, okay, some parts by BBL, but some part by lecture. Okay, this part is BBL and this part is lecture. And then they use the lecture to help BBL. No. If, if you, you have to accept the fact that the students are going to be independent learners. Like, once you have student-centered learning, they take ownership. They are the one who is primarily responsible. You cannot say one part is me as far as you, right? Yeah, there is place for lectures. Lectures in places like introduction, complex topic, summary, right? There are place for lectures, but usually, you find that the lectures in the bigger curriculum are helping you to, to approach the paper problem. The lecture itself does not help the participant. The lecture is like a ladder. It helps you to climb up, but we call it cognitive scaffolding. The lecture helps you to get ready for the student-centered learning. The real content comes from the student-centered learning. The lecture that you give will not come out in the exam. It is basically a help for you, but the exams will be testing things which you are learning by yourselves. We cannot be saying that, no, no, this part must be a lecture, as if certain parts the human brain cannot learn but by lecture. Only certain parts can learn by PBL. Right? It doesn't happen like that. The human brain learns through knowledge construction. It doesn't learn through transmission information from some hearing somebody talking. So we have to we can we have to move away from being a 1.0 person in a 4.0 world. And then sometimes when I ask people to write a case trigger, a PBL trigger, without training, you try to write a case trigger, it doesn't trigger. It doesn't stimulate learning. It's just a story. Nice story, that's all. Right? So in the 4.0 world, you need to have skills that fit a 4.0 world. That's why we got that we want to come all the way from Taiwan to help us to, to, to train us in skills of a 4.0 world. Because if a 1.0 person cannot have the skills required to survive and to thrive in a 4.0 world. Similarly, we have PPL tutor, facilitator. You have it in, in your in your in your in your school as well, right? Sometimes when I'm in my PBL room, I can hear the next room. Sometimes in the next room, I can hear a lecture going on in the next room, right? People, the person is talking non-stop. Why is it they do not allow students to explore? Because they believe that learning comes when you tell them the information. Learning cannot be constructed by the student. That's why when the student says something not right, they will stop the student. Interrupt. Answer me. Wrong. Again, you. You. Answer me. They would stop the student. They do not allow students to think and proper thinking is how you learn. You got to make errors and hypotheses before you come to, to the truth in which you are able to connect to your previous knowledge. You cannot just go straight to the right knowledge in which is just passive listening. But they cannot allow that. They said that they will interrupt the students, and the students are so interrupted they, they cannot do BBL because they are constantly being interrupted. And until the system may even tell them. At the end of the session, you must write a report for me of what you learned. Again, we are back to teacher-centered learning, where the, the, first, the teacher has full power to order the students to do things in order uh, to, to fulfill the recovery. But in, in, in student-centered learning, the student take ownership of the learning. You are only a partner. You are not the boss. You are only a facilitator. So if you have this 1.0 mindset to the PBO room, you will not be able to do PBL very well because you still carry 1.0 mindset in a 4.0 world, right? And then, it, I, 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 you know, I, I give very few lectures and then I, I do flip learning, I do PBL, PBL and I, I, I don't have a high view of lectures. But you know what they call me? They call me a lecturer. They still call me a lecturer, but I do very few lectures and I don't really want to, to give lectures. So, so the, even the naming we give, to our, our, our people. Even, even when the semester is on, they say, what do you do during semester? Lectures. So the way in which our ecosystem is like is that lecture is part of our terminology and that's making it difficult for us to divorce ourselves from the fact that we are no longer into lecturing. Lecture is no longer the main way of teaching, but we still call ourselves lecture. So that's why I prefer to say academic stuff or some other words which you can, you can creatively invent, all right? Rather than 
same uh, bacteria all, 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 all over again. All right, this is yesterday's news. Right, I don't know how many of you have, have gone to this uh, coding outlet called Forever 21. Let me try out because I know not, none of you is 21 years old. How many have sat inside the store called Forever 21? Hands up. Nine. Yes, yes. <laughs> you buy it for your doctor. <laughs> okay, so I think there's three hours in Kuala Lumpur, okay? But guess what? Guess what? They are bankrupt now. Right? It, it's bankrupt and all Asian clothes are, are, are stores are going to be closed. Why? Why are they bankrupt? Because the world has changed, but Forever 21 didn't change with it. That is very, very indicative of us as well. Because when the, our education world has changed, we can't change with it, or else we'll be bankrupt, we'll be out of business, we'll be giving way to the robots. So therefore, uh, very critical for us. And I, I want to uh, end, I can kind of end with comment from our what do you call him? Is he, is he a former politician? Yeah, former politician, right? I don't know how to call him. So he said that we are in problem now. He said that Malaysia is not able to compete at the global level. And what do we have to do? Well, he says we must first we must get our education right, and then all the other challenges will be able to be surmount. Uh, we can surmount the the if we get our education right. So how do we get our education right? He quote Elvin Toffler, the futurist, and this is what Elvin Toffler says. Alvin Toffler says that the illiterate people of the 21st century, you know what's illiterate, right? Illiterate means you cannot read and you cannot write. But in the 21st century, everybody can read and write. But in the 21st century, there are people who are illiterate as well. What are the illiterate? The illiterate are people who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. They are stuck in their one zero world. They cannot learn new things. They cannot unlearn the lecture method. They cannot relearn the PBL method. They were stuck in the lecture method. They, these are the type of people who are illiterate in the 21st century. They cannot read and write as good as that because they refuse to learn new things. And then uh, Tun Dai and one more thing, right? He, he put, put one, more, one more comment. And he said that not just cannot learn, cannot unlearn, cannot read them, but also refuse to learn. Oh, that's, that's very personal, right? So in the end, it comes to a personal choice. You and I make a personal decision now whether I want to be in 4.0 or I want to remain 1.0 in a 4.0 world. It comes to a personal decision, right? I don't know whether the ecosystem really needs to push it, but every single person makes a personal commitment and a personal decision of how you want to be an educator, right? Sometimes people go along with it, sometimes you reward something or not. But you need to make a personal decision in order for the future of your students, right? So, so these are some of the few things that I'm suggesting, right? After these suggestions, I'm going to uh, pass on to our speaker. All right, so I suggest, number one, I suggest that who should be assessing who? See, right now, and I think many of your schools, right, your tutor, your facilitator, is grading the PBL student. Is that true? Do you give a grade to your PBL student? Right? If you do that, you know there's a bit of teacher centeredness there. Because the, the students are trying to perform in front of you to, to put a show, you know, to, to, get, to get the grades, you know, and you are having this power over them, you know. And they, they are quite afraid of you because you are going to grade them, right? And so, well, how good is, 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 is this? Because educator is supposed to be a resource guy, no longer the one who, who directs the students, right? So, so does, does grading of students uh, put us consistent with this kind of role of the facilitator? Right. So this paper shows us that when the, the tutor or the facilitator grades the student, their assessment is very variable. Some of them are very generous. Everybody gets very, very high marks. Some of them are very stingy. Everybody gets very, very, very low marks. But this, this, this is not, not acceptable to us, right? But we have so many facilitators. Can you get all of them to do things the same way? I think it's very, very difficult, right? So, so therefore, I think we should change, right? So we want our facilitators to be very good. So good that they can nurture learning as a resource guide in the PBL room. How do you make them better? First of all, they have to know what is good. And who can tell them what is good? The student. The student knows what is a good facilitator and what is a bad facilitator. So now, the students will, will look at all these criteria of a good facilitator and give a mark to the facilitator. And so now, or rather in the future, we'll be able to know which facilitators are doing very well. And of course, which are not doing so well, right? And so, you know what I do in the past? In the past, I used to, every year, give three prizes to the, to the uh, uh, staff who does the most PBL, who is tutor in the most number of figures, you get that price, right? The most quantity, highest quantity. But now, we're gonna change. We can focus on quantity. We're gonna give a price to the top quality facilitator who are able to engender learning in such a way that students say they are very good. They help me very much in our independent learning. So that will be a new criteria where we are 
focusing not so much on the quantity of, of, of doing PBL, but on the quality. How good are you? Because if you are, if you are not doing PBL, consider work well, the students are interrupted and disrupted by you rather than helped by you. Is that good? No. So we have to find some way in which our faces have to start working in a 4.0 world and not bring the 1.0 mindset into a 4.0 video room. And this is one, one beginning step. Okay, first of all, focus on the team. The team learning is very critical. If the team is dysfunctional, then the group will learn much less. So therefore, we, need, we, ne we are not starting something called debriefing. So at the end of our, our trigger, the students are uh, uh, told to have debriefing, especially part C, where every member has the right to point out to another member how he or she is not happy with that member, right? Because if you have resentment and bitterness among each other, you cannot have a good team. So therefore, we have a debriefing whereby you can sort out all your conflicts so that you clear up the conflict so that your team will be friendly and courteous and be working as a team to help each other to learn in such a way that it's beyond the ability of one person alone, but you enhance and synergize each other. That's why we start a debriefing now in order to focus on the team because the team is the one that produces and, and, and uh, curate the knowledge, right? Not the not facilitator. So we have to focus on the team, how to improve the teamwork. That one, we are teaching not our, our people from our time, we are teaching what they call digital natives, right? So digital natives are those who are born in the time of the internet, whereas we, they call us the what? The digital what? We are the what? Are we native? No, we are digital. <laughs> I can't immigrate, right? And then the word they say is immigrant. We're immigrant, you know? We did not come from the internet world. We, we migrated to the internet world. But our students were born in the internet world. They are digital native, right? So this, this, I think this is a book about teaching about, about digital natives, right? They are from Generation Z. You know, they are very social. So they are able to talk to each other. They continue their conversation with each other. They are social. That's why in my training the students, I said to them that in the between the first and session, PBL session, you are going to form uh, a, a messenger app, WhatsApp group, whereby you continue to discuss and share the links, web links that's very good, pictures and videos, so that you continue your social way of interaction, which you are doing with all your friends 24 hours a day. You continue that because learning never ends. There's no end to learning. Question and answers are always in the mind. So therefore, we cannot stop the learning at the end of the, of the Monday. So therefore, um, they, I expect them now to be using social media also to continue the learning process so that on Friday, when they meet together the second time, they roughly know who is going to say what, who, where each other is going. All right? So we've got to make sure that with Generation Z people, we make use of the fact that they are, they are, are very, very used to uh, yeah, yeah. See what they're young, they've got screen edges. Screen edges, they're looking at the screen all the time, right? Yeah, this is them, this is them. Not you, but them. So that's how we got, to, we got to teach in such a way as to make use of the way in which they learn. Right? Last one is that we got to have not just a change in approach, but we got to have an ecosystem that rewards the change in approach. The whole ecosystem must be the one that supports uh, the, the, new, the new transformative learning and digital delivery. For example, we have all have annual appraisal, right? Annual appraisal. I'm saying that annual appraisal must give good marks to those who write triggers because when you write good triggers, uh, with the help of Prof. David Data, when you write good triggers, you are helping students to think and prop and praise. You are contributing to the curriculum. You are contributing to learning directly. But when you're giving lectures, what are you doing? You're putting people to sleep. So therefore, our appraisal should be giving high marks to people who contribute to the curriculum in terms of quality, not quantity like quantity of lectures. That is not the way to evaluate. That's not the way to reward. We must reward in, in, in such a way as to encourage people to work in a 4.0 world and the rewards are tied to the 4.0 approaches. Right? Second, last is promotion. Very important topic. Promotion must be also including the fact that you are involved in transformative learning, teaching, delivery. You cannot be promoted easily if you're a person who keep on giving lectures or lectures when the world is no more learning by lectures, and you still get lectures and you'll get promoted. So even promotion criteria has to change and is being changed, by the way, uh, in order to reflect transformative teaching learning in the brain. So the ecosystem must be there. Without the ecosystem, you can do a lot of things and in the end people gravitate towards the same old way to be rewarded by the same old rewards. So in other words, we are starting from your own decision. You have to decide for yourself how you want to be an educator and, and your ecosystem, your institution must reward that and together our students will benefit.